welcome everybody, both in the room and in the virtual space. Um, welcome to our November CIFAR seminar. We uh, just to remind people or orient them to what the structure is of these seminars. We always we we have an outside speaker. Keith Horvath, whom will be introduced in a moment, but we always pair that with a local early stage investigator as the opening act. And so uh, it is my pleasure to get to introduce the opening act, and then he will introduce our primary speaker in a moment. So uh, to keep us on track, um, let me introduce Dr. Jose Gutierrez. He is a nurse scientist and assistant professor in the Department of Family and Healthcare Nursing at UCSF. He is interested in equity-centered research that applies market research techniques, such as conjoint analysis and discrete choice experiments, to understand the preferences and needs of historically excluded populations to include the to, to, sorry, to improve the delivery of HIV treatment and PrEP interventions. Plus, he are, of course, uh, veterans who, prior to his faculty appointment at UCSF, received his master's in science and PhD in nursing at Yale University and completed his postdoctoral fellowship with the National Commission Salvage Program at UCSF, where he continues his involvement in the role of uh, Associate Program Director of Equity. And we're not doing all that. He is a frequent uh, burner, having gone to uh, Burning Man five times, <laughs> where he co-hosts a country and Western themed camp that's known for running around and giving away free hot dogs. Um, so <laughs> I, I think that's going to be the focus of this talk. I'm not really sure, so we'll just let him pick it from here. It is. Thank you. More stories to come. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to uh, see you guys here. Thank you for uh, for your attention and, every, and for being here. Um, so my name is Jose. Uh, I am going to give a talk on identifying practices using market research choice experiments within healthcare research. Um, there's a lot to cover. Uh, all within like eight minutes, especially how it applies to my work. So I think the way I'm going to start off is just with an example. So imagine you're on a research team or some kind of healthcare delivery team um, that's charged with uh, creating or developing a new or novel implementation intervention for a monthly HIV and or PrEP antiretroviral tablet for high-risk populations or maybe populations that are um, high-risk to uh, being out of care. So I know this doesn't exist yet in in the, in the public space, but just pretend like envision that you're tasked with designing this new um, intervention. So you, you're thinking of the guy, you probably think it's probably um, a good idea to start with uh, soliciting um, input from key, uh, key uh, informants. So the first focus group you, you conduct with uh, providers, they say, yes, you know, any intervention with a monthly tablet should definitely include visits with an HIV or ID clinic, and we should ensure that you can still pick up these monthly tablets at a local pharmacy. Your second focus group with the community advisory board tells you, yes, we also think it's important that this intervention gets done through a telehealth or a video format, um, perhaps maybe even done through a mobile band for a hard to reach population, and maybe increase uh, uh, convenience through mail delivery for to get uh, mail medications. And then your third focus group tells you that it's also important that whatever intervention you come up with for this monthly tablet, it's important that it's free or close to being free, and perhaps it's a, a good idea to have support available to remind you to remind them to take a monthly dose. So as you can see, you have these emerging uh, pieces of information, characteristics, or attributes that key informants are finding important to have in this. But how do you decide what to prioritize? How do you decide which is more important? This is all qual data at this point. So how do you know where to focus on? Because these are all pretty different characteristics that might not be realistic to all uh, incorporate within a new intervention. So one of the things you can do are one some things that some people have done, they've done a ranking exercise where perhaps you just rank which ones are most important. And this is uh, decent to get an insight of what's important, but what, does, what it doesn't tell you is just how much more important certain things are over the other. So for example, you might find that one and two, most people might prefer or think that the clinic is probably more preferable to a band, but you don't know just how much more, like perhaps they're really close, um, but this doesn't really tell you just the magnitude or the difference and importance between each uh, step. So this is where choice experiments can come. So choice experiments are market research techniques um, that uh, are standard preference methodologies uh, that are developed in uh, economics. So it's a tool for tailoring products and services to the end user. So they are useful to identify which attributes to prioritize and hypothetical or potential therapies such as are 
monthly tablet example, and they can inform implementation strategies for broad intervention uptake. And they can also guide priorities for new or existing service delivery models in case there is an existing service delivery model that needs improvement. And they also have predictive value in real world health choices. All right. Okay, so there's a couple different approaches within stated preference research. So um, three examples. One of them is discrete choice experiments. I'll be covering that one. Another one is best worst scale, also known as max diff analysis. And a third one is also called choice-based conjoint analysis. And I won't be talking about that one. Um, these are all uh, different in theoretical bases. And sometimes um, uh, researchers use these uh, terminology interchangeably in incorrect ways. Um, but they're similar in the process of how they're developed and implementation. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the discrete choice experiment, and this is what I use to answer uh, the problem of HIV and PrEP within military men have sex with men. So I conducted a study um, to address the question of um, how do we increase PrEP uptake among military men have sex with men. So within the military since 2012, the incidence of HIV has not changed. And PrEP uptake is low. So how do we encourage people who can benefit from PrEP interventions to engage with them? So I developed a discrete choice experiment that centered around five attributes, such as the dosing method, um, the type of healthcare provider, uh, where people can get PrEP, the, which is the location, the dispensing venues, as, to, as in where can you receive the medication, and then how can you perform your lab work? So this is an example of what a, a sample discrete choice experiment task looks like. So you have uh, three choices that all have differing levels of the attributes. So people will select which one is the most attractive to them. And once they've selected that one, then um, all of the attributes change again slightly. Some of them will be similar, some of them will be different, but people will keep uh, 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 selecting choices until we can determine uh, which attribute level are the most important ones. So what you get is uh, we'll, uh, you will conduct um, hierarchical bays to uh, attain the utility score, which is the measurement of value that someone places for a certain attribute. But then you also get the relative importance score, which is just how important um, that attribute is driving the choice. So within this population of 429 um, military men who have sex with men, um, they found the dosing attribute to be the most important. So that's that 45%. So if you kind of conceptualize how a decision is made under like 100%, so 45% of that decision is made by just the type of dosing that was available or presented to them within the task choice. Um, while the provider type was the second most important, it's still pretty similar in importance scores with the location, lab location, the dispensing venue. So really like the most important thing to focus on is the dosing method. And if we look a little bit more closely about sort of the utility scores at each of the levels, uh, particularly the dosing method, um, most uh, military MSM found the daily to be the most attractive option, but they also had similar second place uh, preferences for the uh, injection and the prep implants. Um, so what's kind of interesting is that this study was conducted before the injection actually was rolled out. So um, that's one thing to keep in mind when you conduct these studies is that uh, perhaps like you are, um, when you present an option that's not yet available, people are, uh, are doing trade-offs of what's currently available with your uh, conceptualization of what that is. So um, when we presented it, we presented it as one injection. Now today, we know PrEP is like two injections, multiple injections, or it's just different. So um, that's one thing to keep in mind when you conduct these studies is sometimes things are different when you present them um, in ways that are hypothetical as opposed to something that's in existence. So if you look at the other types of uh, preferences they have, they uh, uh, prefer the military provider, they would want their visit through a smartphone. Um, they would want to provide their labs and uh, get their medication both on base. So this is something that tells us that um, to really keep in mind about the type of prep dosing when it comes to implementing prep programs in the military, there's a preference for daily tablet, but also interest in uh, implants and injections. So to ensure that these methods become available as soon as they become accessible as soon as they're uh, available. Also, on-base options highlight the need to strengthen the military resources for prep uptake, since uh, this is the, uh, the preferred venue and access pathway that they would want to um, get their medications. Um, the second thing uh, I'm going to talk about is the maximum difference best word scaling analysis. And this is a way to understand uh, least important or most important. And we use this method to understand health-related services that are most important to be offered on an HIV mobile health band in Alameda County with PIs at a legal soon average. 
So what we did was we uh, under we um, when we were trying to address the upstream factors that are related to HIV infection, which includes homelessness or unstable uh, housing. So what we did was we conducted qualitative analysis to understand um, what are the services that uh, people who are unstable housed within uh, several encampments in Alameda County would want to see in a mobile health plan. So we came up with 32 services that would want to be uh, offered or that we were informed by this population that they would want to see in a mobile health plan. So what we do is we take those 32 courses and we conduct a, um, a massive exercise, which is an example that you see here, um, and you list them all out, and then people will select one that is the least important and one that is the most important. And people will keep selecting until we get the data, the choice data that we need. Now, this is really small, but um, what, we, what we see here are the uh, important scores for all of the services. So we found that 14 out of the 32 services um, were ranked the most important out of the population. And the three highest that ranked were health case management services, mental health counseling and therapy, and mental health uh, screening and referral. Um, so six of the 14 related uh, services were related to behavioral health and social services. And six of the eight remaining services um, were related to personal hygiene and supplies. So um, what's interesting about this is that this population that is highly, uh, that has a high prevalence of uh, people who are unstable housed are asking that uh, for services that are not normally seen on a mobile health care, such as health case management services or mental health counseling. So um, I think this is really important to, to think about how we re-envision or reimagine the kind of services that we offer on mobile health care, um, as this is uh, data that's driven by the choice. So in summary, choice experiments are very powerful tools to identify and quantify relative importance or attributes of products and programs. I think it's a great pair for people who do qualitative analysis because um, you can then uh, take that qualitative data and quantify it to understand the levels of importance for different types of characteristics and attributes. Um, it's important to do formative work and pre-testing, but very essential because no analysis can fix the flaw design, um, which is why you wanna make sure that um, uh, intent or uh, in depth quality of the, uh, data is collected so that way you are collecting choice data on um, the factors that matter to them the most. And also, caution required interpretation, particularly for prepared across models, models or studies. Um, as I mentioned before, like in my previous study with uh, PrEP, um, sometimes you come up with a, a choice that doesn't really translate into real life once it actually comes into uh, practice. So sometimes you want to be careful with how you interpret that kind of data when. Um, when the actual service uh, is, 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 is in real life. And then the last one is incorporating practices can improve quality of health services and increase uptake and interventions through patient-centered care. So um, thank you so much for uh, listening to my talk. And I don't know if you're supposed to take questions or- I think maybe we have time for one question. <laughs> if we have one question from um, the virtual or real life audience. Um, Oh, Monica has got her hand up first, although I don't know if people well, mind it. I just wanted to ask, so you, thank you. So um, that's great. This is a patient population that you look at. Why do you think there's been no increase in HIV infection in the military? Like, is it because I had a patient who was discharged from the military mm -hmm. after he became, um, he, he became HIV infected. Yeah. So um, do you think there's so much stigma that people are hiding? I think that's exactly it. So. Um, in case people are familiar, the military has had uh, an institutionalized discriminatory policy called Donuts Don't Tell, which specifically prohibited people from being out, uh, which in turn prohibited them seeking HIV preventative services. And that uh, was that policy was uh, ended in 2011. So there are still people who are serving in the military who have lived through that period. So I think um, there's still a history of stigma that exists. Um, and I think just the level of distrust of not being sure if um, just how open people can be with their um, sexual health practices. But also, uh, Monica, like the military is really behind on really great um, or novel uh, prep delivery options. It's, um, there's a lot of issues with deployments, um, a lot of issues of getting the medication that needs to get. Um, I think a lot of providers still aren't comfortable with providing prep in the military, even though it could very much be a primary care kind of thing. There's a bunch of waivers and and things that make it very inefficient to get across in the military. So, okay, I am can I borrow this for one sure. second before you do. Okay, um, so if you have more questions or comments for Jose, please put them in the chat, and hopefully you can monitor that 
Yes. To it and, and respond. If not, we'll make sure to get those to him later. Um, and so now I will will transition to the next section. Thank you. I'm trying to pull up. Should I stall a little bit? Um, it reminds me of the like, story. <laughs> it could so be a long crazy. story. It could be a short story. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> I forgot the story. Okay. All right, everyone. I'm very excited to uh, introduce Dr. Peter Horvath. He is a professor in the Department of Psychology at San Diego State University and a member of the Behavioral Medicine faculty in the SDSU UCSD Joint Doctoral Program in Clinical Psychology. His primary focus of research is to develop and test HIV prevention and treatment interventions for sexual and gender minority adults and youth, where he uses both qualitative and quantitative methods to identify community informed best practices for HIV related and health interventions. In addition to his research activities, he teaches a doctoral level course on grant writing and evidence based behavioral. Uh, medicine um, interventions and is also the director of the Improving Health Outcomes uh, Through Technology, also called IHOT, which I'm a big fan of, of name wise. So great branding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks, so I've had mixed uh, reviews on that. <laughs> People interpret it in sort of different ways, I suppose. Um, hopefully, not that narcissistic. Um, well, thanks so much for um, <laughs> inviting uh, me to, to give this talk. Thanks so much today for the really nice introduction. Um, uh, so I'm excited to kind of talk with you today about sort of advancing M health interventions for the PrEP care continuum. I have no uh, disclosures to uh, the disclosures. Okay, um, first and foremost, I just want to thank um, some of my colleagues uh, at SCSU and UCSD, as well as the Adelaide and Parallel Network, which there's one sitting in the audience here, Al Lu, um, as well as other folks that you'll be hearing about some of their research today. So um, I'm sure it's not an exhaustive list, but I appreciate all of their friendship and um, working with them. So um, my uh, real goal today really are threefold. Uh, one is I wanted to sort of uh, give a brief description of sort of where we are with the pressure continuum, talk a little bit about end health interventions and sort of where we are with uh, those in terms of addressing PrEP, um, and then spend most of my time um, presenting three ways that we can better use end health for uh, to address the PrEP care continuum and then hopefully have a few minutes maybe for, uh, for questions. Um, so as you know, um, daily oral PrEP uh, in the form of Truvada was approved in 2012. Uh, followed by the SCOBY in 2016 as another form of daily prep. And then, of course, I'm uh, very uh, excited um, when um, uh, Apertude, an injectable form of prep, was approved just in December of last year. And, you know, I think we can all agree that prep uh, has really changed the landscape uh, pretty substantially just in terms of clinical care and as far as our research. Um, but it does present a number of challenges that I'm sure many of us are very aware of. So, in particular, uh, getting insane on PrEP requires a number of behavioral steps where patients may falter. Um, so first, uh, people need to be aware of PrEP, what it is, what it's used for, how it can benefit them. And then second, um, people who might benefit from PrEP then need to agree to initiate it, um, which um, they have to go through an evaluation and be provided with information about how to take it and what other sorts of behaviors they need to do to stay on it. And then, of course, uh, when someone is prescribed PrEP, then hearing and persisting on it is needed, which requires things like a follow-up you know, follow labs, patient assessments, you know, making sure that they're uh, refilling their prescription, as well as continued adherence counseling, uh, which we know is um, can be challenging. Um, and I think we can all agree that, you know, it's a lot of the benchmarks, we're not sort of reaching those in a way that we really want to optimize the benefits of PrEP. Um, across different average populations. I'll just give you a few examples. So this is a study that was um, conducted by uh, Ian Holloway, or is led by Ian Holloway, and it was um, a group of prep eligible sexual minority men in Southern California, and they were um, followed over three annual waves of data collection. Um, so you kind of see the black line here um, that when we look at prep familiarity at that third annual wave, it's really high. It's about ninety two percent. Um, but when we look at actual prep use, it's pretty abysmal at uh, less than 8%. Um, we also find, find some um, really important differences by geography. So on the right-hand side, you see here um, a, a study where they actually looked at things like hearing about prep, willingness to use, having a discussion with their provider, and reusing prep. Um, there aren't too many geographic differences by 
uh, hearing about PrEP and willing to use PrEP. But boy, when we look at um, having the discussion with the doctor for actual sort of behavioral actions um, and, and reducing PrEP, then we see that there's some real disparities um, in suburban and especially in rural areas. Uh, I grew up in rural areas, so I, I understand those disparities as well. Uh, geographic differences in PrEP coverage is also really obvious in state level data. Um, so in 2020, the average PrEP coverage for people who might benefit from PrEP was about 25% overall. Um, and the highest um, coverage of PrEP was in New York at 47%, followed by, or, or not followed by, but on the other side of the spectrum, Puerto Rico had the lowest um, coverage at 4%, followed by West Virginia at 10%, and my home state of Wyoming at um, 11%, so not great. Um, and we also, of course, know that PrEP coverage varies substantially by some really important demographic factors. So here you see the estimated percentage of PrEP coverage among those within each group of people who would benefit from PrEP. Um, so um, pretty obviously that the uh, only group that sort of reached over even 50% coverage was for people who identified as white. And we see some real um, uh, disparities when we look at uh, Black African American folks and then Hispanic Latino folks who are um, really underrepresented here. Um, we also find some differences in uh, people who were assigned female sex at birth, as well as adolescents who um, are less than 60 percent covered with PrEP. Um, so we clearly have a lot of work to do on the national stage. Um, and also for um, the stage in uh, or what we see when we're looking at uh, in San Diego, um, so where I live. And, um, also, I want to thank uh, Mallory for the invitation to remind me of what fall weather uh, feels like and what the weather <laughs> feels like here. <laughs> we really don't get that in San Diego. Um, that's been brisk. Um, but uh, the data you see here are uh, from the Good to Go Clinic. So the Good to Go Clinic provides free HIV testing, same day prep start services, and a comprehensive prep services. So it's kind of a gold standard for, for prep care um, in San Diego. And we analyzed data uh, from November 2018 to whoops, where did that go? I was using my clicker, I may have. Oh, there it is. Okay, <laughs> see, there you go. Just wait for a few seconds, it'll be fine. Um, so, the Good to Go Clinic, um, like I said, is a gold center. So, we analyzed data from uh, November 2018 to, to March 2020 when we looked at the prep care cascade. Um, and uh, didn't find great findings. We, um, so among uh, those people who were eligible for PrEP, which was 1,259 people, uh, 456 of those, or a little over a third, were actually interested in starting PrEP. Um, 249 people actually started PrEP, and then we look further down the line, um, the numbers get worse. So only 126 had their first follow-up visit for PrEP, and then 67 um, were sort of retained in care or passed that first follow-up visit. So that's only about 5% of the people who are eligible for PrEP. So we have some real uh, work to do uh, both nationally and uh, where, I, where I live in San Diego as well. Okay, so let's turn to mHealth for uh, PrEP. Um, so, you know, how can we use mHealth in a way that um, can hopefully uh, move the needle? Um, so uh, the first place we want to look at is the compendium of evidence-based interventions and best practices for HIV prevention. Um, and so we have um, uh, six studies that are sort of PrEP related. Um, and what you see, at least in the compendium, and I think those, some of these have been advanced to more unhealthy versions of them. So I'll just say that right now. Um, so we have six interventions that um, uh, that do are considered unhealthy interventions that really address uh, PrEP adherence through primarily text messaging. We have a couple more interventions that use minimal digital sort of tools but aren't sort of M healthy. And then um, we have light steps for PrEP, um, which didn't, at least in the compendium, but I think it's been moved to a more M, M health, um, uh, M -health uh, uh, delivery tool. So M health, regardless, is uh, really represented well in the compendium. Um, I also want to note that in 2021, the um, Community Preventative Services Task Force also recommended uh, M health interventions for PrEP adherence. And so they uh, reviewed the literature between January 2000 and June 2021. They found seven studies that sort of met that criteria. Six of those were uh, US based, um, and almost all of them sort of uh, were tested on sexual minority men or men with sex offenders. 
Um, so when we look at those uh, those studies, what we find is there's a couple that use apps, one that use an app plus text messaging, one text messaging only, and then uh, three that were text messaging plus some other digital uh, uh, features. Um, almost all of the interventions use automated by automated or personalized bidirectional messages, uh, but we did have three interventions that use unidirectional messages. And then here you can kind of see some of the features that they um, that they used. Um, to, uh, that they sort of delivered as, as interventions, so including uh, primarily medication reminders, a lot of information and education that they were sort of pushing out. I mean, here it's tracking, and then some used support groups and counseling. Um, they did identify a few evidence gaps, which I think are really important. One is that because these interventions have been primarily done with men with men, um, we don't really know how effective they are for other really um, at-risk communities. Um, and so that's something we want to really um, uh, flesh out. And then the other thing is we don't have a great information about how well some of these digital interventions work side by side with in-person services or other sort of more, more intense uh, services. And I'll get back to that point later on in the talk. Okay, so where does this leave us? Um, well, the pros of end health interventions for PrEP are that they appear to be effective, especially for PrEP adherence. Um, M-Health interventions are widely accessible to participants when we look at their accessibility data, with the caveat that most have been done with sexual minority men. And then, you know, current evidence and recommendations suggest that M-Health will be an essential part of a scalable PrEP intervention. So I think we can kind of safely say that M-Health is sort of here to stay. Um, but I think we do have some real challenges for it. And um, so I'm going to spend the rest of my talk talking about three challenges that I've been sort of thinking about in my own work. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. I'm sure we could all brainstorm 100 other challenges to mHealth. Um, but here are the three that I've been thinking about. One is that um, mHealth interventions tend to be a little bit siloed. Um, mHealth prep interventions also, and, and uh, as we know, if you've ever written a grant proposal using mHealth, you'll get this critique all the time, that they sort of fail to um, address endemic or structural factors. And then the third is that our um, mHealth interventions really have not kept up with current dosing formulations and, and um, our formulations and dosing strategy options. So let's talk a little bit about this first one here, um, that mHealth interventions tend to be a little bit siloed. Well, I think we have to ask ourselves, you know, why is this important? Why do we care if they're siloed? So I have a few ideas on that. One is, you know, having multiple interventions that cover uh, just part of the prep care continuum requires patients to kind of find those new resources that they kind of move on to a different part of the continuum. Um, and we, we kind of know it's at these times that um, people are most likely to fall out of care, right? So we want to sort of have a bit more continuity there. The second thing is we tend to sort of think of these uh, the prep care continuum in some ways like a unidirectional uh, sort of continuum, right? People start in and they kind of move through the steps and, um, you know, they move on to persistence and adherence and everything's great. But what we knew, know, of course, from plenty of research is that people start and stop prep and then restart prep all the time. And so we really want to sort of uh, develop interventions that sort of recognize um, that, that um, you know, people will sort of go back and forth along the continuum and we really need interventions that kind of support uh, nudging people towards restarting it um, if it's appropriate for them. Okay, uh, so um, here is just a quick example of sort of the title of nature of interventions. And again, uh, I took this mostly off the iTech website. So, um, uh, Al, you might uh, have beg to differ. Um, but um, it's just an illustrative example. So um, as part of the iTech network as for the adolescent trial network for HIV prevention, um, there are six uh, studies that really address PrEP, including uh, one of my own that I went with Kathy Reback. It's called Tech Step. Um, and these three studies tend to focus more on sort of the PrEP uptake um, part of the care continuum. Um, and then we have three studies that sort of focus more on the PrEP adherence and persistence. Uh, part of the continuum. And um, I have a uh, zero doubt that that the results of these studies, which I think are going to be forthcoming in the next year or so, uh, that the results of these studies will really make an important contribution to um, our understanding of prevention for youth. Um, but um, the thing we just have to sort of be honest about is sometimes maybe their effect their their effectiveness might be sort of limited to a part of that practical character care continuum. And is there a different way that we can kind of expand that a little bit more? 
Okay, so um, to address uh, the um, sort of the siloed nature of current prep interventions, um, Dr. Susan Little, who is at UCSD, and I recently received an R34 uh, grant from NIMH, and it's to develop and test an M Health and in person HIV testing intervention that we're hoping that will cover a broader spectrum of the prep care continuum. So ESEP um, will be tailored to both sexual, uh, sorry, to, to transgender women and sexual minority men. And it consists of a, of a set of M Health delivered components delivered prior to an HIV, uh, in person HIV testing visit. Uh, to sort of prepare people for that visit to help them hopefully under kind of think of themselves as a good candidate for PrEP, which we think is a, a major reason why people are not accepting same-day PrEP when they come to, the, to that visit. Um, and then for those people who start PrEP, then we'll deliver a set of post um, HIV testing components through mHealth that really focus on PrEP persistence uh, and adherence. And so you can see here are some of the pre um, HIV testing components, including um, information about HIV testing and PrEP, uh, the benefits of starting PrEP and PrEP and intersectional stigma. But we really also want to kind of make them more actively engaged in the in sort of their um, um, uh, sort of accepting themselves as a good PrEP candidate. So we want to do things like we know they're probably going to be a good candidate for PrEP when we screen them in. But we want to heighten their awareness of that. So we'll give them sort of a brief survey um, about sort of like their uh, risk profile and then um, basically say, you know, it looks like you might be a really good candidate for PrEP uh, to kind of get them sort of think about that. Also preparing them for the HIV testing visit where we can give them um, some uh, questions to ask their counselor or their provider about what is PrEP, you know, and um, what is involved with it so that they kind of compare, they come prepared with some of those questions. And then finally, an easy way to schedule their appointment. Um, at that um, at that testing visit, in-person HIV testing visit, it will be done at Owen Clinic. And so, we'll, of course, we'll do HIV uh, testing. Um, if they're still a good candidate for PrEP, we will uh, do a full PrEP uh, intake involved with uh, doing a screening and assessment of their insurance coverage and helping them navigate that insurance coverage, which is a major barrier, as we know, and doing that intake visit. And then importantly, we want to provide people about, uh, with information about housing, substance use, mental health resources, and kind of talk about different ways uh, that they can access those resources, which I'll get uh, back to later on in the talk. Um, here are the post-HIV testing components. Uh, so it includes things like PrEP adherence reminders, adherence feedback, PrEP appointment reminders, and then check-ins with participants about how well their formulation and dosing strategies, strategies are really working for them. So you can see this sort of schematic. Um, I've read this where I can because I worked way too long on it. Um, so <laughs> so uh, just to kind of get an idea of what we're going to be doing, we'll enroll um, 120 game by sexual uh, and other MSM. And um, that will be 85 of, of those and 35 transgender women. Um, uh, randomize them two to one to the intervention or control. Um, if they're enrolled in the ESEP intervention, they'll get the pre testing um, components to prepare them for that visit. Everyone will do a visit when they come in uh, for HIV testing. And if they start PrEP, um, then those in the ESEP intervention will get those, get those or unlock those post HIV testing components. But importantly, if they don't start PrEP, they still have access to the pre HIV testing components to kind of nudge them towards starting. And then importantly, also, if they discontinue PrEP, then they can still have access to those pre components to kind of, again, maybe at some time down the road, sometime down the road, think of themselves as a good candidate. Okay, so that's one way we're thinking about um, sort of addressing a fuller prep care continuum. Um, let's go on to the second challenge. So the second challenge is really um, about how do we address some of these endemic and structural factors. Um, and oh, let me go back here. Um, one of the things that I think is really um, uh, important uh, to sort of uh, ask ourselves. Oops, okay, that's that. Okay. Uh, there we go. So when we think about sort of endemic and structural factors, um, I think um, we're we're really talking about a constellation of factors that we know are really important uh, barriers to to prep uptake and adherence. So we think about things like access to healthcare, um, substance use, drug and alcohol use. Um, addressing mental health, and then things like community violence and interpersonal violence. Um, and we certainly know that 
um, addressing, certainly acknowledging these factors in interventions is critical, but probably more importantly for a lot of people will need to actually address them in sort of a more substantive way. Um, so I want to present just a couple of studies that I've been involved with recently to kind of highlight some of these uh, systemic factors uh, that people are bringing up. Um, so one of uh, these is, is a systematic review that was led by Stephen John at Medical College Wisconsin and uh, Madeline Dang, and they did a systematic review of 33 studies prior to March 2021, where they looked at barriers, facilitators of uh, prep uptake, adherence, and persistence among transgender populations um, in the U.S., and um, what they found was sort of a variety of sort of um, individual level and systemic level um, uh, barriers to engaging in PrEP. Um, so one, of course, was the sort of uh, worry about the interaction between hormone therapy and PrEP, which is really common when we uh, ask on people, um, uh, transgender populations. Um, but importantly, you see here that um, issues like stigma and marginalization can really reduce uh, access to PrEP. And that's because they have sort of these downstream effects, um, such as um, uh, increasing the potential for poverty, reducing um, sort of access to housing and, uh, um, and food, um, as well as uh, being a real barrier to employment and incarceration through uh, things like sex work, right? Um, in addition, uh, we see that there's a real lack in med of uh, medical institutions, which is really common, of course, for people who are uh, historically marginalized. Um, we did find a few um, a, a few facilitators of prep use. So one thing is that um, engaging in prep might really facilitate self advocacy and self acceptance. Um, so we can kind of think about how we might want to use those in some of our M health interventions. And then social networks sort of went both ways. If you have a support, you know, supported social network, then those are the kinds of things uh, that can really support PrEP uptake and use. But if you have a social network that has, is a little more skeptical of PrEP, then uh, it may not. Um, another uh, study that I want to highlight, um, which I think is really exciting, this is led by Eric Storholm. Um, and uh, this was um, a study looking at the impact of gender-based violence and PTSD on PrEP uptake and persistence in um, a cohort of transgender and non-binary uh, persons in Southern California who that was part of a demonstration project. Um, so um, participants were enrolled in a 48-week uh, demonstration project. And what the, we did is we categorized uh, people into three groups. So um, uh, we looked at their sort of baseline and we looked at their uh, week 48 sort of data and said, OK, there's a high, high group, which we um, uh, measured uh, their genovavir levels through DBS and said that they have high levels uh, in their bloodstream at baseline and high levels in, um, at uh, week 48. The low, low group has low levels at baseline, low levels at week 48. And of course, the high, low group has high levels at baseline and low levels at uh, week 48. And we use those two measures here to look at gender related victimization as well as PTSD. Okay, so here is sort of what we found. Um, and so we um, took a look at sort of um, what were the gender-based uh, victimization scores and the PTSD scores. So let's start with, uh, over on the left. Um, so what we found is that gender-based violence um, seemed to predict low PrEP initiation. Um, and that's kind of shown by the fact that it's actually the low, low group that has the highest scores on gender-based uh, victimization. And it's those uh, groups where who um, who had high uh, initiation as at least at baseline that had lower PTS or lower gender-based violence scores. So it looks like gender-based violence might sort of um, be predict sort of uh, poor initiation. Um, on the other hand, PTSD was sort of the opposite. What we found out was that it was a high high group who had the lowest PTSD scores, but it was these other two groups, uh, low low and high low that had low persistence over time. So it's sort of, uh, we're sort of theorizing that it's uh, PTSD actually is more predictive of poor prep um, persistence. Um, so I think these are really compelling findings when thinking about some of these endemic factors and how they could really uh, impact um, different parts of the prep care continuum. Okay, so um, where do we go with this in terms of M health and how do we start to address some of these factors? So um, I think we need to start thinking more flexibly about M health interventions. 
um, with some of the components delivered possibly um, through digital technologies. And then especially for people who really have high levels of systemic or structural barriers, then we need to sort of start pairing those uh, digital interventions with more intensive sort of in-person or more intensive um, interventions. You can imagine even being done through Zoom or something like that, um, rather than sort of um, lightweight sort of um, digital interventions alone. I think there's a whole group of people who don't have as many of these barriers, and we can use these digital interventions to kind of nudge back toward prep use and prep resistance over time. So uh, this type of hybrid approach isn't new, um, and it often gets critiqued, of course, for being a little too regional resource intensive. But again, I think we can make the case that there are some people that digital only interventions might work very well for, but we really have to identify these people with these big synthetic and structural factors that will need more intensive interventions. Um, so at that end, um, Kate Music, Audrey Pettifor, Lisa Haifa Whiteman, and myself are currently planning at stages. Um, uh, in the planning stages of a study that we're calling LIFT, um, also known as linking youth to prep services. And we're going to have sort of these two um, components, broad components, um, that, that are part of the overall intervention package. One is sort of the structural level um, delivery of prep to a place where the youth chooses. So rather than making the youth come into the clinic, or we're going to say, hey, where do you want these prep services to be delivered? Obviously, do you want it at their home or do you want it somewhere more securely like a friend's home or at some other community place? Um, so that is um, uh, one part of it. And that will be delivered uh, by a community health provider, probably a medical assistant or a nurse, which we have to look at state level regulations around that. So uh, lots of interesting nuances to that. Um, but then between the DHP visits, we'll have a mobile app where we we'll focus on helping people sort of um, persist and adhere to their uh, prep medications. Okay, um, this is really busy, but I'll just quickly summarize. So uh, the mobile uh, delivery where we take prep services to youth can involve things like actually delivering prep and doing um, uh, injectable prep injections. Um, again, that'll be um, an interesting a uh, way that we can sort of think about how do you implement injectable prep out um, into the uh, non-clinic areas. Um, we'll also be um, uh, doing clinical assessments like HIV testing, collecting specimens, having a brief discussion with participants about sort of how well is their formulation and dosage strategy working for them, um, and sort of thinking about if the change needs to be made. And then importantly, where we're talking about systemic and structural uh, barriers, uh, you know, um, really trying to connect them to mental health and substance use services as well. Um, and then we have this mobile app in between, um, pretty standard things like a monthly check-in to see how well their regimen dosing options are working, any changes that need to be made. We would, of course, um, send them to their provider to sort of brainstorm those changes, right? Um, and then just providing pretty standard things like adherence reminders, self-monitoring of prep and sex, which will be important, especially if somebody is on, on an on-demand strategy, because we have to know when sex occurs. Um, and, uh, we'll also provide appointment reminders, a way to schedule their next CHP visit, um, and then um, just providing information about sort of prep, HIV, and other sexual risk reduction. Um, so this is just one way we're kind of thinking about um, how do we sort of pair digital interventions with more intensive interventions for people who have uh, some um, potentially some real barriers to, to prep. Um, we do know that this is going to be challenging. Uh, we're not naive about that. So we asked people in a different study that I'm leading with uh, Lisa Whiteman called Poems about um, what they think about the um, pros and cons of home delivery. So um, person, um, people sort of brought up most notably the convenience of it. Uh, so this person says um, there are people who um, don't have vehicles. It offers another um, option for people to be able to um, still have um, that kind of protection regardless if they um, can't go into the office. They also like the privacy uh, component of that, but we know that there are some real um, barriers too. Like people were, were concerned about, you know, is will this be really available through sort of rural or suburban areas? Um, they were actually concerned about sort of lack of provider interaction. They, and they a lot of them said that they wanted to have interaction with the physician. Um, and so, you know, that's something we'll have to kind of think about. Um, I love this one about personal spaces. So this person, which is easier for me to read up here, my eyes are going open. Uh, so um, this person says up here, I would uh, mentally have to prepare myself, like I got to clean my space and get ready in the same way that 
I'd be getting ready to go to the doctor's office. So I even thought about that before this person said, like, oh yeah, people might feel a little anxious about somebody coming into their personal space. It's like, you know, before if you have um, like a housekeeping services, you, you know, people clean up before their housekeeping services, I suppose, right? <laughs> and so it's, it's sort of that same thing, like if I have to like clean up my space and it's will that be uh, kind of more of a pain than not. Um, so uh, so it'll be an interesting study and stay tuned for that. Okay, so I want to um, then end with talking about how we can uh, use mHealth to address some of these really emergent formulations and dosing options, um, which are exciting, but um, you know, how do we keep up with them? Um, so we know that, for example, there is a daily oral prep, which requires people to take um, uh, one pill once a day. Uh, then we have sort of on-demand oral prep, which requires uh, um, two pills, two to 24 hours before sex. One, uh, one dose 24 hours of birth after first dose, and then a, a second dose or a third dose sort of uh, 24 hours after that. And then, of course, you have now uh, Cavalé, a uh, long acting injectables. Exciting. It's very loud. Yeah, <laughs> the missing adult. Are we going to pause here for a moment? Okay. Okay, Unless you've seen the missing adult. What's that? Unless you've seen the missing adult. I have not seen it. Well, Monica did leave, so I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was. Okay, okay, good. Okay, it <laughs> sounds good. Okay. Um, so we do know that. So, um, you know, one thing we know that um, on demand isn't approved by the FDA. It's certainly supported by a lot of European countries and uh, um, with the International Antiviral Society in the US. Um, but we do know that people are mixing and matching dosing strategies. The data I'll present here are actually were done before Cavalier was uh, approved, or or I think the last uh, final assessment was literally like a month after Cavalier was approved. So we don't have anybody on Cavalier, so I won't present any of that data. But um, in the um, prep it and health intervention that I had with uh, Jason Baker, we um, followed guys for about nine or ten months. Um, and we collected whether they were on daily dosing, on demand, or discontinued. Um, across these four years, we had 66 people we had complete data on. Um, so what's interesting, if we look at those 66 people, about two thirds of those use a daily uh, prep strategy throughout the entire uh, study period, which um, is sort of what we might expect. Um, we had another eight people who um, only use a daily strategy but discontinued at some point uh, during the trial. But interestingly, we had 18 people who used an on-demand prep strategy at least once during the trial period. And as you can see, there's really no like pattern that stands out. They were sort of all over the place, um, which I think is a really interesting way that people are sort of switching or kind of using on-demand, um, or uh, in some cases, just sort of like discontinuing too. Um, what we also found were some differences between um, people who only use a, a daily strategy for the whole thing, that includes people who might have discontinued, compared to those people who use an on-demand prep strategy at least once. So when we look at race and ethnicity, um, it, it was people who identified as Asian or Pacific Islander um, who were the most likely to use um, an on-demand prep strategy um, during the trial um, at 61.5%. Um, versus if you look at Hispanic Latino um, participants, those people actually, uh, none of them use a day or an on-demand strategy anytime during the trial, which I thought was really interesting. Um, the other thing is that we found some differences by outness. So people who were less out to family, peers, and the medical providers um, were, um, were more likely to sort of use an on-demand prep strategy at least once during the intervention trial. And so outness might be sort of an interesting important factor to kind of monitor around how people are choosing what kind of dosing strategy to use. Um, okay, so um, let's think about it then um, about sort of how we can sort of leverage um, M health. And so one thing we did is we asked guys, um, if you were to switch from a daily regimen to an on-demand regimen, why would you do it? Like, what would be the biggest reasons? So the biggest reason that people noted was that they just weren't having sex very often. Um, and so what we can do is we can kind of think about, you know, um, we can self-monitor sex in our apps. And you might have one, uh, one month where people are having pretty regular sex. And so it makes sense for them to be on a daily regimen. Um, and then maybe in the next month or two, it just kind of really slows down and does it really make sense for them to be on a daily prep regimen that they're not having sex uh, that frequently or maybe for some of us 
really frequently, but of course it depends on the perfect person, right? Um, but it may not make sense in this case. And then maybe they go through a higher season of risk and they start having a lot of sex again. And so it makes sense for them to go on a daily regimen. So we can kind of think about M Health um, in terms of, um, you know, sort of monitoring this and say, hey, we noticed you haven't had uh, much uh, sex lately. Um, have you thought about trying an on demand prep strategy? And, uh, you know, if it is sure, um, here's how it works. Um, I, a few other things that people are really worried about were the long term effects of PrEP and ongoing side effects. And this could really um, kind of cause people to be less adherent with their medication. Um, so you can see here, if somebody's worried about long term side effects, if they want to take um, their daily dosing uh, infrequently. So, again, in terms of our health interventions, we can say, hey, it looks like you know, you're taking PrEP. Uh, it looks like taking PrEP for you isn't really working very well. Um, if we ask them to self-monitor, um, would you like to see some other options and then show them other options? And then that can be, of course, on demand or on um, catalog, uh, depending on what, um, what might work best for them. And the last one I'll example I'll give is um, dealing with um, injectable prep um, as well. So in that same home study that I mentioned before, we asked uh, young men, average age of 21, um, what they uh, thought were the pros and cons of Cavalier. Um, and um, they brought up two pros, which was convenience and peace of mind. Um, in terms of peace of mind, this person says, you know, a covered situation where hookups can be spontaneous. Um, they can be um, planned and then they can be um, canceled. Um, so just having uh, the injectable um, uh, uh, seems much, much uh, simpler. And I will say that it was interesting when we were asking guys about different dosing strategies. When uh, people were talking about an on demand dosing strategy, one guy said that if he took the two doses um, uh, for on demand, then he felt like he had a lot more pressure to have sex if he was going to do that. So um, it's interesting to compare that to Cavalier, where they're saying, you know, I can decide if I want to have it or cancel it, and it doesn't really matter. Um, but the cons, of course, um, are few. So fear of needles, uh, people don't like needles in general. Um, the worry about sort of the burden on medical visits uh, that they may have to make. And then, um, of course, um, what happens if they miss um, a dose of their uh, injection? So here this person says, if you can't predict your travel um, or your schedule or life happens and you miss the day that you're supposed to get an injection, you may not have pills to fall back on. So, uh, so what we can do with mHealth is we can sort of monitor um, how if they went in for their, um, went in for their injection, um, and it says, you know, it looks like you kind of miss your injection appointment. Um, do you have oral prep with you that you can take? Yes or no? If yes, then we can sort of counsel them through taking oral prep and, and then help them um, uh, help them sort of set up their next appointment. If they don't, then we can do some risk reduction counseling until they can get to that next appointment. Okay, I'm going to end up on some closing thoughts. Um, so, uh, uh, and then we'll open up for, dis for some discussion. So um, first, you know, I think M Health presents opportunities to address the full prep care continuum in really essential ways. Um, we just really have to understand how it can be used with the greatest impact. Um, relatedly, relatedly, it's sort of unclear sometimes whether M Health plays a primary role in delivery intervention or more of a supportive role. But I really think in either case, we really need to know more about how it can be used to address systemic and structural factors. And uh, certainly the PrEP landscape is changing quickly, and we need to expedite mHealth strategies to support new options. And then uh, finally, we need more research on ways to use mHealth for PrEP care continuum with average populations such as uh, transgender women and people who um, use drugs. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, NIMH and NICHG who sponsored the research that you heard about today and both are sponsors of the ATM. And uh, that's it, open up for questions. Thoughts? I've got a microphone and I have a question. Great. <laughs> so, thank you for that. You covered so many topics in a very efficient period of time. Okay, so here's okay. as I was looking at all that, my question for you is of all of these beautiful, fantastic studies that you have going on and you told us about yeah. with their wonderful uh, study names and beautiful logos. I know all of we love all of our children the same, but what are you most excited about? Which one? What's oh, your favorite that you're working oh, on? No. Oh, 
It's yeah. their it's choice. Which one? Um, honestly, I'm really excited about the list study where we're, we're going to try home delivery of prep to you. And I think there are, I, I think all of us have a lot of anxiety about how that's going to work out. Um, it's something that we have to think about broader things like state level laws, right, around who can deliver those kinds of things. But I think the idea of pairing home delivery and, and really kind of working with you where they want to sort of get, you know, receive prep for about that kind of thing, paired with sort of this uh, digital uh, component that can sort of uh, hopefully optimize um, and keep them engaged in their care between business. I think that's just a really exciting study. So that would be my that project, but I'm not telling anybody. <laughs> it's not being recorded, I promise. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought what was, was really interesting as well. Uh, I was curious what proportion you think will elect for the home delivery and sort of um, how are you coordinating? I mean, potentially could be a lot of care sites. Uh, it's a yeah. very complex study. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, is, you know, uh, for, you know, how many do we think will offer sort of home delivery? Um, we, I, I think part of it will be, we're going to think about the inclusion criteria of whether or not they're open to um, receiving prep care outside of a, a clinic setting. Um, I, I think um, we will certainly, I, at least from what when we were at the grant, we did not necessarily mandate that they receive um, home prep delivery. Um, uh, but I think we are certainly going to be sort of encouraging and asking folks if that's something they might be interested in. Um, I um, I'm not certain how many will actually do it, um, and I think part of it depends on um, sort of the regions of the country where we're recruiting. So we're hoping to recruit in more, um, at least in some sites of the ATN, um, in more uh, sort of uh, semi-rural and rural areas. And I think in those areas where we really want to see if this kind of model works, then we might have more people opting for sort of prep home delivery. Um, so I think it's going to be hard to say, but that's something we're going to have to flesh out um, in the next year to kind of figure out what sites are available. So the site, um, it, it was really challenging to write the grant because it was actually split into two, two different grants. One was sort of um, the scientific leadership group and all the studies you see here. The other one was the operational side. So when we wrote the grant, we actually had no idea which sites were going to be available uh, for people um, to recruit from. But it is basically a, essentially a network of sites around the, the U.S. Um, uh, who will be who will be taking part in this. And so those are the sites that we're really going to be working with. And trying literally our first goal is to try to sort of vet their sites and see which ones have a good mix of geographic diversity and are able to, or are actually practically able to implement home delivery. So <clears throat> really great talk. It sounds like um, there's plenty of work to be done uh, and uh, with you to already know that they're at risk and um, yeah. know about threat. Uh, but um, it, I, I still wonder whether um, our younger uh, you know, teenagers who are just you know, reaching sexual debut, who may not be out uh, yet, yeah. um, <clears throat> whether they uh, there may still be a barrier in terms of understanding the availability of, of, of PrEP uh, and um, and understanding that they may be at risk um, uh, and, and whether there are, there are interventions that are required in that group, uh, you know, to... Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question um, in terms of really reaching sort of younger adolescents, right? So we know that with uh, PrEP, the, the big... Um, Determination is sort of as, as weight, um, is weight, sort of how how um, how much do youth weigh, and you know to make to, to make them sort of eligible for prep. So in terms of like the lower limit on age, um, I can't remember, I don't think that lower limit is more of a weight weight factor, right? Um, but um, we do know from the prior ATN, and I would love to hear uh, Al's experience. I know at least in our studies. Uh, we struggle to get the 15 to 17 year olds. Once they start to be 18, 19, 20, we're able to sort of recruit them pretty well into our studies. And I know with this new run of the ATM, they're really kind of focused on what about these 15 to 17 year old uh, youth who are at risk and having uh, sex, but again, for a variety of reasons, um, it could be developmental, but also could be the fact that they're still looking at parents or some kind of guardian. That they don't see themselves sort of a good as a good candidate for prep. We do have, of course, um, a waiver of consent for these um, youth, but that's going to be um, a, a, 
I'm guessing still something we're going to have to work with them to be able to deliver it to them. Um, so I think that is going to take some, at least with our operational centers, some real sort of thinking about like, how do we even reach these youth um, in a way uh, that we can um, uh, start to, to sort of engage with them. And I, I'm guessing that's gonna somehow be some kind of community recruitment, um, a mix of community recruitment and online recruitment. Um, and, um, but I think in general, we just need better ways of engaging this really like at risk adolescent population. I don't know, how do you have any thoughts on that? That's a hard population. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that, that was definitely was a, um, a challenge with our studies um, yeah. in enrollment for teen detection adults. And I think one thing we realized were some of our eligibility criteria around um, behavioral risk um, may have been too stringent. Yeah, that's so a great point. We actually made the modifications partway through. Great point. Open it up to folks who may not be as sexually active, but interested in it that, you know, we definitely right. would want to include them. Um, I mean, ideally, you would want to sort of get people at least engaging and thinking about PrEP as an option, you know, you know, around sexual debut or slightly even prior to sexual debut. Exactly. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. Um, and that was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Um, uh, my question was around, I, I really like your first point about the title, make the um, continuum and that the, the paths are kind of in this generation yeah. focused on one part. And I'm wondering, um, as apps sort of mobile health sort of address multiple steps of the uh, continuum, we have thoughts about ways of um, either staging the the um, components that are presented to people so that it's not so overwhelming. Because we've also heard from folks that this app has so many different features, like how do you even yeah. like navigate it? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> yes. So here is something I thought about adding, but I ran out of time to put into uh, this presentation. I will say, so for many, many years now, in fact, most of my career, I have sort of taken this approach because you hear in focus groups that when you ask um, people what they want to see in mobile apps, and everybody's done this, we the same response. We want everything. We want every aspect. We want everything included. And we want um, full tailoring of all features of the app, which, of course, um, we aren't Facebook and we aren't, um, you know, uh, all these sort of apps that have unlimited resources to do this. And so I, I uh, for many years, I've sort of built these apps where we just have like, tons of different features and we sort of expect people to sort of like navigate it. And what we find is that people use a few features and ignore the rest. Um, so I think, I think um, sort of when you were asking sort of that question, I was thinking, you know, uh, I think for people it just becomes overwhelming. They're sort of not sort of thinking about like, how do you, you know, how do you navigate this app in a way that, feels like you can actually help me think differently about prevention or adherence or whatever it is. So the way that we're kind of in our heads, we're kind of thinking about it is um, if we can sort of, so one example would just be is that maybe each week um, or each few days, they get like a text message saying, okay, it's now time for your next part of um, the activities we're going to ask you to do. And, and they click on it and they get sort of a bite-sized piece of that activity. And then they sort of are done and they don't have to do any more. Um, and then uh, if that goes to an app, they can sort of access other things if they're interested in it, but we're kind of asking them to go through like a bite-sized activity. And then maybe in three or four days, we send them another text message we link saying, okay, it's now your time to kind of do this little activity. And it's sort of, sort of a guided approach, but as that sort of builds in the app, then people can start accessing these other things that they want to sort of do it. But we know that people are sort of getting um, more of a guided sort of bite-sized pieces um, of um, information or activity in a way that doesn't feel sort of overwhelming to them. Um, and then those people who are really active and want to explore other parts of it, then can go off and sort of explore other parts of it. So that's, I'm not sure if I answered your question there, but I think we're just thinking of the same thing of like, I think when you build these really complex apps that just have tons of features, I think people just sort of get lost in it a bit. So Monica, maybe the final question? Yes, All I right. think I'll just... you get your question in? Yeah, really great. This is very innovative work to, to do it in this way because people do use apps and, and, and mobile health. And I know um, I'll have been our local person for this, but my question is, 
you performed, I think, one of the first books at I Am Capitano Bears Prep and Young People once it was available. Yeah. We had all of these surveys prior to this. Oh, when will, uh, what would you, would you like to use it? But it, it's profoundly important to do it once it's available. Yeah. And number one, I want to know when that would be published and where. Um, and and can put that out. And number two, that I think this is where we have to push is on that type of content where I think it's pro, like pro and, and would this and help um like remind people to come in every two months, remind people to get an HIV viral load every two months. Like how is the how is your platform going to incorporate that? Mm -hmm. Um oh in terms of um I am yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was very um, So, I mean, so the, the data we collected on asking youth, um, we asked youth about different, um, I think that's where you're referring to on that cut, is that we asked youth about um, daily prep, on demand prep, and how a tiger beer is sort of their, their beliefs on it. Is that the one you were yes. referring to? Yeah. And so, once um, it was available, right? Once you, you know, we had, that was before. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, that, okay. yeah, I just want to be clear about that. Okay. was before okay. um, it was available, but we sort of knew it was coming down the pipeline. Um, and so, um, so it was before, but I think what you see is a lot of synergy with sort of um, emerging literature about sort of uh, people's pros and cons of that. And the nice thing is sort of we asked about those different dosing formulations and injectables but with the same group of people. So you can sort of almost follow their, um, pro, you know, like you were saying with the decision, um, uh, decision modeling, sort of like, you know, how are they weighing the pros and cons within the same group of like, on-demand prep versus daily prep versus uh, Cavalier. And so I think that that's kind of an interesting comparison um, in that. And, and um, uh, it's something that we're, we actually have a draft paper ready. We're going to sort of submit that sometime soon, but we're happy to share that also as a draft if that's something that's um, uh, interesting. Um, and then and in terms of the other question was sort of how are we going to incorporate that? Yeah, what are the kind of things that should be reminding when people are not in touch? Is it like you, just the two month injection or like HIV RNA or like how are you? Yeah, I mean, because I think you're not reminding them around the time of sex or, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I think it, it changes the way that we think about sort of how do we promote adherence in this group. So we're going to have to sort of think about more. Um, uh, more information about the importance of their healthcare yeah, visit, yeah. right? Because that's the thing that's going to be really critical is a healthcare visit. We're also going to have to be thinking about sort of um, uh, some barriers uh, to that, which again, you can see one way we're addressing is like trying to bring it to them in one of our studies. Um, but I also think that, you know, um, you really have to sort of uh, get into this because my sense is people are going to be mixing and matching these different formulations and dosing types over time. And so I think um, for us really trying to um, across all these studies have um, regular conversations with people about, you know, is this really working for them? And if not, are there other options? Um, so I think, you know, so, and then of course, just plain education about what it is and things like the tail on it and why, you know, if they stop Cavatera beer, you know, here are some of the things that we're going to need to sort of think about um, to address that sort of long tail that we're still trying to figure out how long that tail is. So, um, so I think it's going to be sort of a constellation of education, uh, really reviewing their options, um, and then really trying to um, be pretty uh, bold about sort of getting them to their to their next appointment to stay on track. Yeah. All right, I think we've um, kept you beyond your time. Um, I'd like to one last round of applause for both of our speakers.